is Andrea Shogalola, and I'm here to tip off this episode that's all about the game of basketball. Yes, basketball. Let's talk about the history of game, the science and math of it all, and end with a celebration of March Madness, which is an extremely popular basketball tournament that happens every year. But we're gonna do it in our own special way. So get your book brackets ready, and let's start the first quarter. It's time for Shakespeare Says. Beware the Ides of March. This has been Shakespeare Says. Why couldn't the basketball go on vacation? Because it's not allowed to travel. What does it mean to be on a team? Did you know when you play basketball, you're not only practicing your physical skills, such as hand-eye coordination, but you're also working on soft skills as well. Soft skills include communication skills, like how you talk with others, listening skills, time management, empathy, among others. Wouldn't you rather have teammates who listen to you and are nice? Wouldn't it be great if your team captain was good at explaining the plan? These are all soft skills that we constantly are working on to get better at. Another skill is working under pressure. In basketball, players are always under stress, but yet they need to stay cool, calm, and collected while making sure to use good communication skills so they can score points. If you crack under the pressure of the clock, you can let your team down. This also leads into good sportsmanship. It's so important to have good sportsmanship, not only to the other team you're competing against, but also among your own team. You never want to tear down your teammates. You always want to build them up and help each other. Skills like these will take a lifetime to learn and you never truly finish working on them. This also goes beyond basketball or sports in general. So when you step out on the court, have fun and remember, it's not whether you win or lose, it's how you play the game. Did you know? Did you know the tallest female basketball player is from Poland? Margot Didek who stood at seven feet, two inches tall, played for the WNBA. The tallest male player was Suleiman Ali Nashnus, who played in the African country of Libya in 1962 and was just over eight feet tall. The shortest woman to play in WNBA history was Shannon Bobbitt. She was only five feet, two inches. The shortest man to play was only one inch taller than the shortest woman. Muggsy Bogues was five foot three and played for the NBA. You can check out the DVD Space Jam from the Fort Worth Public Library and see Muggsy play Michael Jordan. I'm sure you've heard of basketball legends like Michael Jordan, Kobe Bryant, and LeBron James, but there are some people who make decisions that can decide where their team wins and loses and they don't even play in the game. The coaches. Did you know that there's a coach who led teams right here in Fort Worth and has won the most high school basketball games out of any boys basketball coach in the whole United States? Coach Robert Hughes began coaching at a school called I Am Terrell High School and he led his team to win three state championship games. When I Am Terrell High School closed its doors in 1973, Coach Hughes was asked to coach at Dunbar High School. He then led this team to win two state titles, win runner-up three times, and also led his team to finish in the final four 12 times. Coach Hughes' coaching style also helped him receive many personal rewards. He's been inducted into the Texas Black Sports Hall of Fame, the High School Basketball Hall of Fame, the Texas Basketball Hall of Fame, and even the Naismith Memorial Basketball Hall of Fame. He's been featured in numerous news stories. He visits college basketball teams like TCU to speak to players. And one of the kids from his very own team made a documentary on him. Yep, he's kind of a big deal. Coach Hughes played a significant role and led his team to win 1,333 basketball games. This proves you don't have to be the best player on the court to win and that combinations of knowledge, dedication, and skill can be a winning formula. And now, Let's get literary. If playing basketball isn't your thing, maybe reading about it is. Or maybe you love playing basketball so much that you want to read about it too. In either case, we've got some great stories to recommend. If you're in first, second, or third grade, you may relate to L. Ray Jakes. He's the shortest kid in his class and sometimes has trouble fitting in. L. Ray has a whole series of books by Sally Warner, but in L. Ray Jake Stands Tall, he shows his whole class that even the shortest kid in school can have mad basketball skills. Did you know that the famous Michael Jordan was also once smaller than the other kids? In this picture book, Salt in His Shoes, 
Dolores and Rosalind Jordan, Michael Jordan's mom and sister, tell the story of how MJ used other skills to make up for being small. If you think you're not very good at basketball, you may love Hooray! My Butt Left the Bench by Henry Winkler. Hank wants to play on the team to help defeat his school's rivals, but he's terrible at basketball. Will help from his friends and his dad be enough? This series, Here's Hank, is printed in a special font that is great for kids who have dyslexia or other reading challenges. If you're in third, fourth, or fifth grade and have ever been told that you can't do something just because of who you are, you'll love Lizzie Legend by Matthew Ross Smith. Lizzie is an amazing basketball player, but she has to fight to play on the team at school, which is only for boys. But she doesn't stop there. Lizzie's got her sights on the NBA. If you're in 5th, 6th, or 7th grade, you should definitely check out Kwame Alexander's The Crossover. This book won the Newbery Award, and it is awesome. Josh and Jordan are twin brothers who both love basketball, but they're starting to drift apart. Check out this book in its original form as a novel in verse or the graphic novel version. And did you know that basketball legend Kobe Bryant wrote books for kids? Check out his Wizenard series about how basketball changes the lives of five young players. Dribble over to your Fort Worth Public Library branch to check out some of these slam dunks. There are some ball players who are so ancient, their stories are inscribed in stone. Here we are at an ancient ball court in Chichen Itza, Mexico. It sure doesn't look like your modern neighborhood rec center. The Mesoamerican ball game, played with a solid rubber ball that weighed 10 pounds, was played by many different cultures and people. The Olmecs created the game, the Maya adapted it, and the Aztecs memorialized it with sculptures. This game was definitely a full contact sport. Players often sustained injuries while playing the game. The Maya added a stone ring for a bonus point opportunity, but getting that 10 pound ball in this hoop was a very rare event. While you can't go to one of these historical sites to play a game of ball, you can play a less dangerous version of the game called Ulama, which still survives in Mexico today. I'm glad that this historic sport is still being celebrated and practiced. Basketball has been around for almost 130 years. It's one of the few uniquely American sports, and it was invented in the winter of 1891 by a grad student named James Nysmith. He wanted to make up a game that could be played inside safely during the long New England winters. He was a teacher at Springfield College in Massachusetts. The outdoor sports of the time wouldn't work, so he had to invent something. Nysmith took rules, tools, and ideas from several other games and mixed them together to make something magical and new. Passing comes from American rugby. English rugby gives us the jump ball. From soccer we get the size and shape of the ball and the Native American sport of lacrosse gives us the usage of goals for each team. That's a great start, but the game wasn't finished yet. One of the missing pieces was how to figure out if a point had been scored. He thought and he thought, and he went to ask the janitor if he had any big 18-inch boxes to spare. The janitor went to look and came back with round peach baskets. Would these work? James said yes, and he nailed the baskets to the bottom of the balcony in the gymnasium, 10 feet off the ground. Now they had baskets and a ball. The last thing to do was make up some rules and play. James Nightsmith wrote up 13 original rules, and the first game was played with nine players per side. Someone was assigned to sit in the balcony and get the ball out of the baskets and back to the players when somebody scored. After a few games, one person had the idea to cut the bottoms out of the baskets so the ball could drop through, and the game of basketball was born. The game spread like wildfire. The guys who played at Springfield College took the game with them to their own YMCA's and taught it to other people. The rules were also published in the YMCA magazine that circulated all over the country. By 1905, it was recognized as a permanent winter sport in colleges, high schools, and athletic centers all across the country. In 1895, the rules were updated and only five players were allowed on the court per team. Introductions of the three-point line and shot clock happened much later in the 50s and 60s. Women's basketball wasn't far behind. Once those rules were published, the women's colleges of the time picked up the sport too. In 1892, Sarah Berenson read the rules and introduced it to her students at Smith College. 
Clara Gregory Bear wrote the first book of women's basketball in 1895, and the sport was officially established. Slam dunks used to be illegal. In 1967, dunking was outlawed by the NCAA. When they brought it back 10 years later in 1976, crowds went wild! March Madness began as a small basketball tournament for high schoolers in 1939, and the idea was then picked up by college coaches, and the tournament grew from only having eight teams participate to a whopping 68 teams. The exciting thing about March Madness is that you don't even have to play basketball to be involved. Fans of different teams create their own game brackets by trying to guess which team will win each game using a tournament bracket. A bracket is a diagram or a graph that shows a series of different games played in a tournament. Did you know that math can be used to predict a winner? For instance, if you know the blue team scores at least 100 points every time they play a game, but the red team only scores 85 points a game, then you can guess that the blue team will probably win the game, and this is called probability and statistics. Although a March Madness bracket guesses the winners of basketball games, we're going to use our own brackets to guess which of these classic book titles will be crowned the champion of our very own March Book Madness Tournament. We'll begin our series with the Sweet 16 Tournament of Books, and then 16 will turn into the Elite Eight, and then eight will become the Final Four, and then our four will become the final two books that will duke it out in the championship round to become the 2021 March Book Madness Tournament Champions. All of our winners were voted to advance by a group of 100 library workers. Our starting contenders are The True Story of the Three Little Pigs versus Goldilocks and the Three Bears, Good Night Moon versus Harold and the Purple Crayon, If You Give a Mouse a Cookie versus Miss Nelson is Missing, Green Eggs and Ham versus The Hungry Caterpillar, The Polar Express versus The Giving Tree, Dog Man versus Harry Potter, The Rainbow Fish versus Where the Wild Things Are, and finally, Diary of a Wimpy Kid versus Charlotte's Web. Now it's time to put on your thinking caps and try to guess which of these books will win each round. I'll see you back here at the bottom of the fourth quarter to announce the winners. Ooh, when it's cold, I don't want to do anything but bundle up and lay around. But when it's warm, I'm ready to play. Did you know that the molecules inside a ball are the same way? And that's what makes some balls bouncier than others. Molecules inside a warm ball jump around and hit the ball's inside surface at a much higher speed. So that's why a warm basketball is bouncier than a cold one. It's that time once again, everyone, a time to play Mascot Blitz. And here's your host, Polo Athletica. Thank you, everyone. I'm so glad you're here today, and I know we're going to have a ball. <laughs> today, we're going to be identifying what city each March Madness mascot, try saying that five times fast, what city they come from. Let's go ahead and kick things off with round one. Starting off with Purdue Pete. What city is Purdue Pete from? That's right, West Lafayette, Indiana. What city is Mike the Tiger from? If you said Louisiana State University in Baton Rouge, Louisiana, you're right! What city is Boomer and Sooner? Yep, that's right, I said Boomer and Sooner, two of them. What city are they from? Did you say the University of Oklahoma in Norman, Oklahoma? You'd be right! Last one for round one. What city is the Billiken from? By the way, while you're guessing, the Billiken is a mythical good luck figure who represents things as they ought to be. If you guess St. Louis University in St. Louis, Missouri, you're right! That brings us to the end of round one. Fast fact, did you know that mascots go to summer camp? Mascot Camp is a one to two week summer program where students from all over the nation go to learn mascot skills. That has to be one fun summer camp. <laughs> okay everyone, time for round two. What city is Otto the Orange from? If you said Florida, you'd be wrong. As shocking as it might be, Otto the Orange is from Syracuse University in Syracuse, New York. 
All right, don't let that last one trip you up. Let's go ahead and move on to an easier one. What city is the Oregon Duck from? I basically gave you the answer for this one. If you said University of Oregon in Eugene, Oregon, ding, 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 you got it right. Oh, that sound means we're out of time for today. Thanks for joining me today and tune in next week for more Learn, Dream, Do Fun. I'm going to create a basketball team for squirrels. Aren't they adorable? This is my jersey I created. I chose these colors because they're my favorite colors and I'm the creator, so I have ultimate power. This is their mascot, Oki, the silly acorn. I challenge you to create your own team. Have fun. For the real March Madness, lots of college basketball teams from all over the country play each other over the course of several weeks. It's fun, but it's a little confusing since there are so many teams. To make it easier to visualize, let's mark where the teams are from on a map. First, we just have to figure out which teams are playing. The real list of who's playing who hadn't been released yet when I recorded this, so I'm starting with this prediction to get a list of teams, but I'll make my own guesses to narrow it down to eight teams. I'll just pretend these eight teams won so far and are about to play each other in the Elite Eight. You can find a bracket or list online at any point during March Madness with the real winners so far. Once you have your teams, look online to see what college or university they're from. Here I'm looking up Gonzaga University, which is in the state of Washington. Then put a thumbtack on a map to mark where that college is. You can find a map of the United States online and print it out with as much or as little detail as you want. I labeled the pins to help me remember who's who. Can you spot which team is from the furthest north, south, east, or west? North? South, East, and West. Okay, now let's connect the teams with yarn or string to show who's playing against who. Once you have all the matchups marked, watch the basketball games and see who wins. Then you can leave the pins in place but take off all the strings and add new string to show the new matchups whenever the winners play each other. And if you don't have a cork board at home like I did, you could always use stickers or draw right on the map with markers. I like maps and I like learning about colleges, so this is a nice activity that sneaks in some geography and college prep. If you try this, I would love to see it. Post it online and tag the library. It's finally time to see if your March Book Madness book picks were actual winners for each round, and we have a lot to go through, so let's get to it. Our Sweet 16 winners that now form the Elite Eight Tournament are the true story of the three little pigs, Good Night Moon, If You Give a Mouse a Cookie, Green Eggs and Ham, The Giving Tree, Harry Potter, Where the Wild Things Are, and Diary of a Wimpy Kid. We then matched up the winners from the Elite Eight and surveyed 100 librarians again, and these winners created our final four round. And they are, If You Give a Mouse a Cookie, Green Eggs and Ham, Diary of a Wimpy Kid, and The True Story of the Three Little Pigs. Now it's time to announce the two book titles that won their rounds of the final four, and these two books will compete in the championship round. And the book titles headed to the championship round are, if You Give a Mouse a Cookie by Laura Numeroff and The True Story of the Three Little Pigs by John Sieska. Before we announce the winner, let's check out the stats on these two books. This may give you a clue on who the winner could be. First, let's check out the stats of The True Story of the Three Little Pigs. There are 24 copies of this book at the library. Kids have checked it out at least 712 times. And in the final four match, 52% of librarians said they favored this book over the book Green Eggs and Ham. Now there are 25 copies of the book if you give your mouse a cookie and it's been checked out at least 770 times. In the final four match, 51% of librarians said they favored this book over Harry Potter. 
This matchup is extremely close. Who do you have written on your bracket to win? And finally, the winner of the 2021 March Book Madness Tournament is... The True Story of the Three Little Pigs by John Sieska. And that's the end of March Book Madness. How many winning titles did you guess correctly? I hope you enjoyed our episode on basketball and March Madness. I know I learned a lot about basketball. I didn't know much before. If you want to learn about basketball, the Fort Worth Public Library has you covered. For early learners' picture books, check out Dino Basketball by Lisa Wheeler. Alley-oops and rejections are orders of the day as dinos play a fast-paced full-court game. Which dino will step up and take it to the hoop? For picture books about college, we recommend Mahalia Mouse Goes to College, written by John Lithgow. Intrigued by the lecture, Mahalia Mouse starts attending class and soon becomes a full-time student. When graduation day finally arrives, Mahalia has a wonderful surprise waiting for her. To learn about the science behind basketball, we recommend The Harlem Globetrotters Present The Points Behind Basketball by Larry DeBra. Have you ever wondered about how a Harlem Globetrotter player can spin a basketball on one finger for so long? You're only a few four-point shots away from becoming a science of fun stuff expert on basketball. To learn about the Paralympic Games, we recommend What Are the Paralympic Games? by Gail Herman. Participants from all around the world vie for the gold medal in a variety of sports, including archery, basketball, swimming, speed skating, and ice hockey. Author Gail Herman describes how these athletes train both mentally and physically for the games and gives the reader a better understanding of what makes the Paralympic Games one of the most viewed sporting events. Don't forget to check out our learning challenges on the Beanstack app. Every year, we partner up with the Mavs to challenge kids to slam dunk their reading goals. Check it out at fortworth.beanstack.org. One of my personal recommendations for playing basketball is to search YouTube for strategies and playing tutorials. Coach Howard is a great resource. Did you know that you can check out a Wi-Fi hotspot at any of your local Fort Worth Public Libraries? You can bring this hot spot on the court to up your game. I hope you have fun. Mm -hmm.